Good evening and good morning, everybody. We are happy to see you today on our webinar. And I'm honored to present our amazing speakers today. And I hope while you're joining, you also are choosing your language and we're giving you some time to do it. So today we have a very interesting topic treatment consideration for substance abuse and behavioral addiction. And we have a Dr. Bradley Zickerman, clinical assistant professor at Stanford University. He um, got his medical education at American University of Caribbean School of Medicine, Florida. He's then completed residency and a fellowship in Texas, Florida, Oregon, and California. We're also very happy to see um, Karen Pearson, who is licensed clinical social worker with many years of experience working with adolescents and substance use disorders. Both Dr. Man, Dr. Zickerman and Karen runs a recovery clinic, which offer clinical service for us struggling with substance and behavioral addiction. As people are joining, I'd like you to remind, please choose your language, Russian, Ukrainian, or English, and with my great pleasure, I'm given the opportunity to present us. All webinars will be recorded and posted on Stanford website. If you have any questions, please uh, put them in Q&A. We also have translated presentation. All right, thank you for having us. Um, so we're going to be going over today uh, treatment considerations for substance use and behavioral addictions. I thought that uh, Karen and I can maybe give a little bit more background about ourselves and what we do. Um, I am, again, uh, by training, I'm an adult psychiatrist, a child psychiatrist, and also an addiction psychiatrist. And most of my, uh, my work clinically is treating youth with uh, substance use addictions and also uh, behavioral addictions. We see a lot of um, technology addictions. I'd say maybe 30% of the patients I see are actually referrals for, um, for screen addictions. And I hope that, you know, we're, I, we're going to have uh, a discussion about screen addictions in, in addition to um, talking about substance use. Uh, our clinic started in 2019 at Stanford, and at this point, it's it's a thriving clinic. Uh, we have lots and lots of referrals, more than I, I really, quite frankly, thought we would we would have uh, show the um, the needs of this population that we are treating. And then, Karen, if you wanted to maybe talk a little bit about um, your background. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I'm a clinical social worker and I um, primarily provide individual and group therapy um, for adolescents, young adults and their families. I have spent a lot of time working with people who have active addiction that are not necessarily really ready to change and across sort of a spectrum of change. Um, and so a lot of the um, people I come to work with have um, different types of co-occurring uh, mental health disorders, a lot with trauma exposure, um, and also with some with you know, developmental disability as well. Yeah, and, and so in our clinic, uh, I primarily see patients who have uh, addictions and uh, there might be potential medication needs. And I also do uh, some, there's therapy involved with my meetings with patients as well. And then Karen handles most of the peer um, individual therapy options and uh, group therapy options that we also offer. So we thought it would uh, probably be useful to start off with going through uh, how we actually define um, substance use disorders in our DSM manual. And um, if you look at this criteria, this is what we use, and this can be applied to any substance use, um, whether it's alcohol, uh, cannabis, uh, even something like, like nicotine, um, you can apply it 
towards, you can apply it towards energy drinks. And I think you can even uh, really apply this towards screen addictions too, if you really look at the criteria here. Uh, when we think about diagnosing a patient with uh, a use disorder, uh, if you look at this criteria, uh, it just takes meeting two to three of these bullet points to meet a mild substance use uh, disorder. Four to five is moderate and six or more would be severe. Uh, so let's go through some of these. Uh, taking a substance in larger amounts or for longer than you meant to. Uh, wanting to cut down or stop using the substance but not managing to do so. If you meet those first two bullet points, you technically would meet our criteria for a substance use disorder. Um, I'll go on down the list. Spending a lot of time getting, using, or recovering from use of the substance, cravings and urges to use the substance, uh, not managing to do, to do what you should at home, work, or school because of substance use, uh, continuing to use even when it causes problems in relationships, giving up important social, occupational, or recreational activities because of substance use, using substances again and again, even when it puts you in danger, uh, continuing to use even if you have a physical or psychological problem that could have been caused or made worse by the substance. Um, tolerance is a criteria, and then developing uh, withdrawal symptoms is a uh, criteria. And we don't have specific criteria for youth versus adults. So we have to, when we're treating teenagers, uh, thinking of, of diagnoses, we have to try and sort of extrapolate and, and uh, apply this criteria that is probably a little bit more relevant for adults, but try and apply that for um, a youth-based population. And there are also studies that suggest that um, if, if a teenager is even using uh, marijuana, cannabis for uh, one or two times in a month that they likely would meet criteria for even a mild uh, cannabis use disorder, for instance. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, uh, criteria for substance use disorders can also be applied to behavioral addictions if you uh, if you look at that DSM criteria that I just uh, went through, um, the presence of the behavior is not completely problematic alone. Uh, when we would maybe diagnose a technology use disorder or behavioral addiction, kind of thinking of that criteria we just looked at, uh, we really look at um, not maybe necessarily the amount of time someone's using uh, like a screen or a video game for social media. It's more how that that use is impairing their functioning. Uh, is it impairing school or work? Um, uh, is it leading to problems with someone's social life, with their um, ability to take care of themselves or self-care? Um, is it interfering with their sleep? Um, their diet, appetite, nutrition, that, that's what we look at when we think about um, if someone has problematic uh, screen time. And some of this might seem uh, obvious, maybe, maybe not though. Um, health risk associated with excessive, um, excessive screen use. So uh, just kind of mentioned Insomnia is a big one. I can't tell you how many patients I've had that um, they're you know 14, 15, 16 years old, and uh, they they're they're playing games until five, six in the morning, and then somehow they're supposed to get to school at you know eight o'clock. And how are they supposed to do that when they're you know only getting maybe an hour? of sleep before school, it's, it's a real serious problem. So insomnia is something uh, we really see with excessive use. Um, there definitely seems to be links uh, with, with studies that are coming out more and more that uh, depression is a serious risk associated with excessive screen use. And then if you're 
sort of stationary. Uh, if you're if you're sedentary, you're, you're going to be at greater risk for obesity, thrombosis, embolisms. You're going to be at higher risk for neck, shoulder, and back pain. And you're also going to be at higher risk for things like tendinitis, carpal tunnel, and other uh, repetitive use issues. So uh, there, there's always new data that comes out on this. I think this is some of the more recent data that we could find uh, regarding screen times. Uh, and this is all, uh, I believe this is all just US data. I don't think this data here captures other um, populations, but in, in the United States at least, um, adolescents age 13 to 17 are spending on average about nine hours per day on screens. That might also include screen time um, that they're using in school. Um, in fact, it likely does. 88% uh, of adolescents own a smartphone and 95% uh, own a laptop. And again, in this country, increasingly school is, um, even if it's not remote at this point, uh, most schools need their, their students to, um, or at least, want their students to use some form of laptop to access homework assignments, things like that, uh, which I happen to think is a big problem, but it is increasingly the way that our school system uh, sort of works. 45% of adolescents say they're on their phone almost constantly. 54% say they use their phones too much. And uh, around 65% of parents say they worry about their children's screen use. So what are strategies to minimize screen time? Um, this can apply for a teenager. This can apply for a young child. This can apply for an adult, a family system at large. Um, I, I think it's important to try and emphasize designate, designating uh, screen, screen free times. Uh, saying as a family, there are certain times during a day that everyone's going to put their, their phones down, their laptops down, and do something else. Uh, it's really important to balance um, screen and non-screen activities. Uh, I probably have less success trying to get families to set up screen-free zones, but I think at least in theory, it's a good idea if a family is willing to try that. Um, it's, of course, really important to exercise and get adequate sleep. And um, this is maybe the most important. If you want your child or teenager to reduce their screen time, it's going to be really challenging unless you're actually also uh, trying to model good um, screen time use. So I'm going to talk about a few different therapy approaches. And of course, you know, we could probably have like full day, several days, seminars on some of these things. So I'm going to try and be really sort of concise and to the point as much as possible. Um, one thing that I always think is really important to point out, uh, of course, is that when we think about how we're going to work with somebody first, we just think about like, are we really you know, in a place where a, a family, you know, a parent is looking for prevention versus, you know, interventions are often for people who have like a higher identified risk or are maybe treatment refusing and interventions maybe something we might do with a parent or family instead of the you know, adolescent or young adult themselves. And of course, treatment really looking at like someone who's got a diagnosable disorder, right? A demonstrable functional impairment um, as a result of their symptoms. One of the um, one of the models we really look at in also assessing like how to select and recommend a therapy approach to a given family and patient is to think about how ready is someone to change. Um, of course, like you know, some um, some models really require that the person accepts you know their diagnosis, they agree that it's problematic, and that they want to change and they're ready to start doing that. And what we know is that there's a big group of people who are not there. And so looking at like, you know, someone who is perhaps maybe like really doesn't think there's any problem at all versus people who are maybe somewhat ambivalent or unsure that we do have therapy approaches that work very well um, with addressing those types of patients so that they can perhaps, you know, um, learn to minimize or reduce their symptoms, which often, you know, um, accompanies reducing or ceasing their use. 
The other really important sort of um, consideration in substance use therapy is looking at what other co-occurring diagnosis like may be going on and how does that sort of impact the type of treatment that you might provide. Trauma um, and post-traumatic stress disorder, of course, is a really big um, thing to think about when looking at substance use treatment. A lot of patients, when you look at sort of their timeline of the onset of symptoms, the timeline of onset of you know, challenges and problems, um, and also you know, certain events that may have occurred, there tends to be this very sort of clear picture around like, you know, one, either the, co the mental health you know, diagnosis starting first or the substance use disorder starting first. So that can sometimes be very helpful in sort of flushing out like what would be the best way to approach them so that um, not just that they have treatment success, success excuse me, but that they don't, um, you don't sort of inadvertently make one of, um, one of these things worse. Availability of services, of course, is another huge, I think, consideration to always make. What can people access? What's doable for them um, in their current situation and environment? And of course, another really important feature of looking at therapy approaches is providing support to family members and significant support persons um, who might be involved in that person's treatment. When we think about you know, in outpatient services, most people are doing maybe one to two hours a week of treatment. And of course, so they're spending so much more time interfacing with their loved ones and with their friends and in their sort of natural environment. And so if we can support and provide, you know, psychoeducational resources to loved ones, then it does really, you know, make a difference in terms of looking at treatment success. Can we move to the next slide, please? In terms of overall substance use prevention, the American Academy of Pediatrics has some pretty clear like guidelines around what they suggest um, in terms of prevention. And the first being is you know, to talk to your children about and young adults about drugs and alcohol. Um, there, you know, there tends to be a lot of hesitancy around this with a lot of different people. And so having that comfort to kind of talk about you know, whether it's just, you know, family expectations or you know, sort of talking about some of the potential risks. Um, I definitely notice in my practice that a lot of young people really don't understand, for example, that um, you know that they can be addicted to um, substances in a relatively short amount of time. They don't really always have a lot of information about you know things such as alcohol poisoning. Um, but I have worked with a couple of youth in the past who, who died of alcohol poisoning because the people around them just thought they were asleep. They really didn't understand what those signs and symptoms looked like. Uh, and of course, like talking to your you know kids about like how to try and decline substances, I think is also like really key because the, like when we think about like the concept of peer pressure, I think that we often present it sort of incorrectly. When we talk about, or we think about, you know, some, someone else's teenager who is influencing ours, right? And making our, our loved one feel bad about not participating. But I think what's really more accurate when you talk and discuss this out with kids is that Peer pressure tends to more so be about what's going on internally. Like, how do I feel if I'm not partaking and being part of something? And how, so then maybe like how to deal with that. Um, setting clear expectations around like rules and spending time like with your teenager is a great way to really kind of get a handle on like what or see what's going on with them. Um, there, as Dr. Zuckerman already mentioned, there is, you know, research that really shows that modeling, you know, behavior it makes a big impact in your own teenager's behavior. And so, the, um, and including, you know, that if, if you're avoiding substance use yourself, that that actually um, kind of results often in your teenager not using. For a lot of people, for a variety of reasons, that's not really um, realistic, that they would have like absolutely zero, you know, substance use um, around their, their teenagers and young adults. And so I think that if we are thinking about like modeling sort of things around responsible use and drinking in moderation, um, that can really make a difference as well. It's also important to correct extreme beliefs. This is especially true um, with the rise of prescription um, drug use, that a lot of kids are under the impression that, you know, if I'm taking some, like an opioid that's a prescription drug, that that's somehow safer than, you know, an illicit drug I might buy on the street. And we know that that's really not correct, especially when we think about you know, the potential for addiction or the potential for a fatal overdose. Um, and of course, like trying to avoid entertainment with children that glamorizes drugs and alcohol. And I think this is actually especially true when we look at sort of late elementary and middle school age children um, who haven't maybe started to experiment or think too much about drug use, that if the only sort of imagery they see is glamorization, then 
um, that's the only message, right, that they have. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, I thought this would be an appropriate place to uh, just put a, a little slide about pharmacotherapy options that, uh, you know, I mentioned treating youth substance use, but you can really say just substance use in general. Um, in truth, there's hours and hours and hours of lecture material on, on this topic. Uh, so I'm going to try and distill this to uh, just a few bullet points. I think it's important to know that we we have more and more options uh, to treat both um, various substance withdrawals as well as cravings. Um, when it comes to alcohol, for instance, uh, we have something called antibus, which can uh, sort of deter someone from drinking. Uh, it, it creates a, um, uh, it, it interferes with, with um, alcohol uh, metabolism and it can make you very sick if you drink when you actually take it, which creates a deterrent effect uh, in regards to alcohol use. Um, our sort of gold standard me medicine that we use to prevent use and cravings would be something called Vivitrol and Naltrexone, uh, which uh, really the studies that we have more and more just show that it really helps to reduce um, the use in someone who both, uh, someone who actually wants to abstain and someone who also is actually drinking and uh, is maybe a little bit amb ambivalent, but they think they might want to at least reduce how much alcohol they're consuming. It can really help with that. There's another option called a campersate, um, which is something that I'll end up using if someone has uh, some some form of liver impairment or liver failure. Uh, then a campersate is something that you can use because it's metabolized through the kidneys. Uh, so that's just an example of um, of, of substance uh, craving. Uh, we actually have options now for cannabis use cravings. Uh, there's something that I use all the time. It's called NAC, uh, which is short for N-acetylcysteine. It's essentially a really potent antioxidant. If, if you're not familiar with it, uh, we've been using it in the United States since the 1960s uh, to reduce the effects of acute uh, Tylenol overdoses, it's the only thing to this day, I believe, that can help to, re to um, eliminate the toxins to the liver uh, in that situation. Uh, and then in the 1980s, we realized it was really helpful for people with COPD, uh, cystic fibrosis it helped them with, with breathing, it helped with thin uh, lung mucus. And then in the 90s through, through now, we've really been studying its effects on um, on substance use uh, reduction and, and addressing cravings. And a couple of years ago, a study came out that I really consider a landmark study in the field of um, substance use treatments, where they took roughly 100, uh, there's roughly 100 um, teenagers who had, uh, who, who were cannabis users, met criteria for a cannabis use disorder, they split those teenagers into two groups. One group had talk therapy and another group had talk therapy, and they also uh, used NAC. And that group that had the NAC in addition to the talk therapy had half as many total days of cannabis use. So I think it's a really important option uh, that honestly, I'd say 95 to 99% of clinicians in the United States don't even know uh, that it's that it helps with, with reducing someone's cannabis uh, cravings and use. Uh, so it is an emerging treatment, but it's something that I think is very important to consider. It's very safe. Uh, there are more uh, questions about it. I'm happy to answer them uh, maybe at the end of the, the presentation. Um, we have options to um, reduce cravings for nicotine, something like, um, like Chantix or Wellbutrin, uh, there, there's, there's lots of options we have uh, in that regard. 
And then as far as uh, substance withdrawal, uh, we have very effective treatments for alcohol. Uh, we have actually effective treatments for, um, for, for cannabis use now. Uh, gabapentin is a medicine that uh, there's increased amount of, of evidence to show that helps with um, that helps with with cannabis withdrawal symptoms. Uh, it's one of the only substances of actually showing um, uh, one of the only medication treatments have actually shown any positive results as far as helping with um, cannabis cravings, and that's become increasingly important. Uh, in, in the United States as the THC content uh, of what most teenagers and adults use has really changed and really increased. In the 1980s through the 90s, uh, the average uh, cannabis product had maybe 5 or 10 percent THC in it. Now we're treating uh, teenagers and adults who are using forms of cannabis that have 90, 95 percent THC. And it's those high THC options uh, that tend to result in uh, pretty serious withdrawal symptoms, withdrawal symptoms that actually can, re can resemble um, the severity of, of opioid use. And then we have medications as well that of course can, can treat the, um, the withdrawal from opioid use as well as help prevent further use and cravings. Um, I think, again, this is a topic that I could spend hours on. Uh, if there are specific questions about how maybe we address specific substance withdrawal cravings in the United States in our clinic, um, I'm, I'm happy to try and answer those uh, at the end of the presentation. So looking at that, like how um, parent support can help and influence adolescents with substance use and behavioral addictions. I always think it's first really important to consider that um, this is not just something that happens to our youth and then the parents are, are there and able to help. Often one of the most common sort of um, criteria we see is an incredible amount of conflict happening between um, youth and their parents around their use or um, behavioral addiction. And so um, providing intervention, psychoeducational interventions to families around, you know, different communication skills um, and looking also at, you know, kind of, you know, developmental stage of adolescent and what sort of things you might be able to do to help like sort of support like the family as a system can be incredibly helpful um, versus, you know, say like the adolescent feeling like, okay, I'm, you know, like I'm doing something to just meet my parents, I'm being treated like a problem. And that's a really hard place to, to start. And so like when we work with the whole family, sometimes that really can um, be the best way to address that specific type of diagnostic criteria. There's also actually some evidence-based practices that exist around um, like parents, you know, parent therapy and parent support to um, using it to offer um, behavioral conditioning to your sort of techniques to help parents really try and figure out ways to reward positive behavior. It's interesting that we really, you know, like most people sort of innately, like we like to get like sort of positive feedback, positive rewards. And um, often these are more effective mes um, methods than punishment. Uh, and so really trying to help people sort of um, kind of balance out like, you know, sometimes punishment of course can be appropriate, but if punishment is the only tool that parents are using, often what can happen is it's just producing the opposite result of what they want, right? Like you punish and restrict your child and they just try to find ways to sort of rebel um, against that. The um, the other part about like looking at parent like interventions is how like you could help them um, sort of create more like motivation for their adolescents to accept help and change. Like the way that parents try to approach and address their adolescents really can make a significant difference. Um, and so especially in thinking about like if I'm if I'm just going to go into conflict with my parent you know loved one around my use then I'm really not going to, like often that's like where I can get stuck I'm not going to start thinking about like, my future um, or what I want to do you know um, even like next month if I'm just really kind of stuck in that um, the present you know in conflict and so same even though it seems sort of in some ways sort of counterintuitive we really want to try and help parents sort of frame things from their own perspective to reduce conflict and so they're heard a little better. Next slide. 
Um, so I always think it's really important to think about the um, the cross section of of trauma and addiction. And of course, you know, trauma, um, you know, is defined really right as the um, like the emotional response that to an incident that was distressing, and it creates like some lasting change often for people in terms of like how they might experience their present, how they operate in relationships. The um, and so the often addiction is related um, because it follows trauma. But people, you know, wanting to sort of um, to cope with and survive the consequence of their trauma can often start to use as a way to cope. And of course, over time, when we look at those diagnostic criteria as the use increases in frequency and quantity, then um, the symptoms of substance use disorder can become so problematic that it's not manageable anymore. And this is um, this is sometimes also harder to really demonstrate for youth because when we're living at home, mom and dad are supporting us and we have supportive you know, teachers in our schools, um, right? Like different types of like significant relationships that that support in a way, right? Sort of um, minimizes the amount of challenges related to use. We think about, right? Like if I'm using most of the time as an adult, I, I'm gonna have a lot of functional problems. It's gonna be hard to get up and go to work if I'm really hungover. Or if I can't make it through the day without, you know, using cannabis, am I really going to be able to sustain my job and then sustain myself, right? Um, just with basic needs, and those are not things that youth typically always need to do. And so that's why, um, of course, we can sort of think back to Dr. Zuckerman said earlier about having just one or two uses a month sometimes is enough to diagnose a youth, and it's because of those protective factors um, that are present. And so the, and of course, like thinking about trauma is that it's, um, if you're developing this coping mechanism as you enter adulthood, your abuse can then become incredibly more problematic and sometimes very quickly and putting people into um, crisis. Um, in the early nineties, uh, Judith Herman, who's an American psychiatrist, um, spent a lot of time at Harvard, to, um, wrote a book called Trauma and Recovery where she made you know a connection between um, traumatic events such as child abuse and um, people who have been exposed to war and like political um, traumas. And she developed what she called like, the three phases of healing from trauma. And interestingly enough, the first one, um, the very first stage really doesn't look at um, trying to talk about or relive your trauma. In fact, it very often tries to avoid like having like a deep discussion or a deep sort of dive into reliving and writing narratives. And instead just really tries to focus on the present. And this is especially useful when we think about substance use. I've had the experience before of you know, people coming into therapy and talking about that they went to therapy in the past, they talked about their trauma quite a bit, and then they would leave and get really high um, and have like a lot of use of the days after therapy because the discussion around their trauma just was really triggering. And so in looking at a present focused trauma model, but really the goal is, is try to help people cope and live in the present and function um, without their substance use. And of course, what some people will discover um, once they've done that work is that they might really want to then do you know, further therapy, doing past um, processing on their trauma, which for some people is incredibly helpful, um, but in a way that doesn't trigger you know, relapse and these substance use um, or behavioral addiction problems again. Next slide. So in particular, one of these models is an evidence-based practice called seeking safety. Um, seeking safety, of course, it addresses both trauma and addiction. It was originally written for, you know, looking at substance use, but when um, when you look at the modules for it, it fits very nicely often with behavioral addictions, because often behavioral addiction also um, sort of rises out of a need to cope. The other sort of strength about seeking safety is um, to its fidelity, it can be used by a wide variety of practitioners, including doctors, therapists, and also peers. And so when we don't have access um, to healthcare, this is actually like a very nice option that you might be able to, um, to, to do this like in um, like, I mean, like a center, such as like a homeless, like a, a homeless like day center or um, in a recovery group. There's no absolute requirement. Um, it's also stabilization safe. So for those who are still currently using substances, 
who are just recently, you know, um, ceasing their substance use, that seeking safety has been shown um, to not um, put them at a high risk or higher risk for relapse. Seeking safety is appropriate for both group and individual treatment. Um, in the United States, historically, you know, substance use has often been delivered in uh, substance use therapy, excuse me, it has been offered in group formats. Um, and that can be like incredibly helpful. Um, however, for some people, group treatment just is really not something that they're either willing to do or able to do. And so seeking safety can be um, delivered to as an individual therapy treatment as well. So seeking safety looks to provide the patient with emotional, behavioral, and cognitive strategies to cope with their trauma. When I've worked with and assessed people, you know, who have substance use and trauma. Usually, you know, when we ask, right, like, what do you like about your substance use, you know, or why do you, you know, why do you think that it's helpful or how does it serve you? That often um, outside of, you know, for youth, we will say, okay, I'm having fun with my friends. And they also might say things like, it really helps me relax. And so if we really try to kind of um, help, like, sort of discern, like, what exactly, like, does relaxation look like to you? You're probably going to get one or two answers. And for some, relaxation means that I can avoid my thoughts. And for others, it's to avoid sort of like physical sensation, you know, in the body. And so having this um, sort of uh, options around, you know, um, behavioral versus cognitive strategies can be really helpful. Some people really don't want to think and they want to figure out ways, right, to sort of um, to relax and use something outside themselves. So that is um, it's incredibly helpful. They also um, provide a lot of like overview around how to use present focus coping strategies, a lot of external distraction technique, and also something that's called grounding, which I think is somewhere in between distracting yourself and doing a relaxation exercise, such as a progressive muscle relaxation or um, breathing. Next slide. Another really, I think, essential feature for substance use therapy is motivational interviewing. Um, it's in particular, this approach is really useful for patients that have low um, motivation or not ready yet to change. And then one of the main sort of like, you know, um, functions of it is to try and explore somebody's ambivalence around what it is that they like about their substance use or behavioral addiction and what perhaps is the drawback um, for them. The um, Motivational interviewing really looks at like different ways of trying to engage patients. Um, and in particular, after like engagement is an initial strategy, right? Because we are thinking back to, if I don't want to stop using, right? I'm, you know, a young adult or here because my mom and dad have a problem with my use or I got in trouble in school and, you know, to avoid some sort of consequence, I'm here to talk about my substance use, that we really do have to work hard to engage people in therapy versus if I'm really ready to change, right, I probably don't have to work um, quite as long on engaging people. The next sort of like sort of process around like uh, motivational interviewing is to really try and help like patients sort of like focus on sort of what's going on currently and looking at like over time um, where like what areas they want to really, you know, try and address. The, um, the other sort of process that we look at in motivational interviewing is that we want to evoke from the patient. Um, youth have had a lot of people tell them that, you know, substance use is risky. Uh, what about your future, right? Like they've, they've heard a lot of that. And so what we want to do instead is like we really want to try and ask questions around, you know, like, like what, like what has been their, their experience? What do they think about all these things that people are saying to them and really have them come to a conclusion that um, there's something about my use that also doesn't serve me. So invoking it internally from them really tends, I think, to um, kind of move them towards change. The other um, part of motivational interviewing that's really helpful is looking at and trying to help with planning. Um, and often this can be a way, not just planning for the future, but really looking at like, okay, like if I'm, um, like how to try out things like, you know, reduction and what would that look like? And so when working with the youth, um, motivational interviewing is often really meant to process ambivalence, but also to try and um, um, really move them to their own uh, perspective. Next slide. Um, another um, strategy um, therapy approach that I sometimes use is something that's called adolescent community reinforcement approach. 
Uh, one thing that is unique about this model is generally it's an individual treatment um, that's meant for both teens and young adults. It really tries to motivate um, change by really helping people sort of look at what, um, what is the difference between the short-term reward that I might get when I'm using substances versus the potential for a long-term consequence. For example, if you're working with a young person who says, I like to get high because it helps me relieve my anxiety. And that is something right, that we really can't, like we can't really disagree. If somebody, if that's their experience, people are the experts on their own experience, if you will. And so instead really trying to help them think about like, okay, well, that's true. But what is the potential for long-term consequence? Um, so, you know, I work with a lot of like young people who, um, you know, are like um, very much interested in a certain career path. And so it's a great question. You know, when you're at the point in life, you're finished, you know, you're training, you're doing this job, will you be able to go to work and um, and be high in order to deal with your anxiety? You know, does like, will it serve you long-term? And sometimes that can be really helpful. And again, because it's, it, definitely borrows from motivational interviewing strategy where you're trying to invoke from this person um, instead of just saying, hey, like you're not going to be able to get high grade data as an adult. It's just not going to work. It also really works to identify reinforcers for sober activity. So if we can get used to agree to try things um, such as any, you know, whether it's sports or spending time with family or you know, often like getting a job and really helping them process like their experience that it um, draws out the potential for it to be reinforcing because they're processing the, the positive sort of experience they had. Um, adolescent community reinforcement approach does include some um, specific community strategy skill for both youth and parents in order to improve their relationship. One of the things I appreciate about this model is that the communication skills is essentially identical. So you're teaching the same thing, but separately. And so that um, for a lot of times for youth right there, because they're often feeling I'm the one being asked to change, but that can create some conflict. So when you're asking them and their parents to do the same thing, um, then we're moving sort of beyond like um, that um, particular barrier. This, um, one of the sort of communication strategies that's really emphasized is that, you know, you know things such as like parents trying to use I statements, trying to speak from their own perspective, but also um, really looking at, you know, the idea of like sort of partial like responsibility with their kids. So instead of really trying to control and force young people to do things, which most people find is generally not really possible, right? That we don't have the ability to force people to do things, even if we really try and instead try so partial responsibility really tries to have this collaborative approach around, you know, like if, you, if they're having a problem, if you're having an issue, I want to work with you and try and solve it with you. Um, this is a very, um, in terms of evidence base, this is the, I think, um, the highest, uh, I guess, or most successful um, therapy approach according to research with about a 70% success rate in participants when they've studied a year, up to a year um, post-treatment. And of course, adolescents, you know, and those who are you know, still attending school, when we think about the potential for relapse, um, you know, still going to school, being around other, you know, peers that use, having like that kind of access that um, relapse potential is high. And so 70% is actually um, quite good. Uh, next slide. Oh, I think, or perhaps that might be the last one. It's the last slide. Um, I, I put this bullet point in, remind myself that I, I thought it would be helpful maybe talk about different levels of care uh, that we typically see within the the, the U.S. system, like how, how we triage um, uh, basically addiction, uh, well, substance use or behavioral addiction cases. So typically what will happen is patients will come to see us in clinic we will use um, a combination of the um, therapy and, and pharmacotherapy options that we we kind of detailed today, uh, and then we'll we'll see how that how that works, how effective that is, and um, if it seems like substance use hasn't changed, um, or you know there's still a lot of, of functional impairments, um, a lot of problems in someone's social life, uh, grades are remain an issue, sleep, 
uh, all those kinds of factors, you know, someone continues maybe be depressed or really anxious, uh, then we might start to think about uh, increasing their level of care. And uh, in the United States, we have uh, two different things. They're called intensive outpatient programs and partial hospitalization programs. <clears throat> and they're programs that uh, intensive outpatient programs tend to be three or four days a week um, for maybe 10 to 12 weeks. And you actually go to the program for maybe uh, three or four hours a day. And you get a combination of individual therapy, uh, group therapy options, and um, often access to a psychiatrist uh, maybe once a week, for instance. And then based on how someone is doing in that level of care, um, and then PHP, partial hospitalization programs, that's a kind of another step up where that tends to be a daily type program for more hours, but you're not living at the program. If you don't um, sort of, com if, if, if you still require further treatment beyond that point, or you know, a higher level of treatment seems necessary, then we think about uh, what we call residential uh, level of treatment, uh, which we commonly kind of refer to as rehab um, in this country where uh, they tend to be anywhere from 30 to 60 days stay. Sometimes they can be longer, sometimes shorter, uh, but that's where you actually uh, live in a facility that uh, sort of a, a pseudo hospital. Uh, there's nursing staff available 24 hours a day. Uh, you live there, you have your meals there, uh, and then you have programming built in throughout basically every day of the week, Monday through Sunday. Uh, so that's how we typically think about, um, about cases in this country. And then let's say someone completes a residential level of care, then we think about discharging them uh, back to their, their home environment, their community. And then we might think about um, having them reside at a sober living facility, which there are lots of in this country. Uh, it's just like what sounds uh, sounds like these are these are essentially homes that are designed for individuals with uh, substance use and they're trying to maintain sobriety. Sometimes they have other services attached to them. Sometimes it's just kind of a home where where these people are gathered, but there's usually some level of service attached. And then um, oftentimes if someone completes a residential program as part of their step down treatment, then they will actually maybe go back into um, an intensive outpatient program. Uh, but at the very minimum, they probably will return to uh, a, a general outpatient clinic, uh, kind of like what we, we run. Um, and then we didn't talk about as we could also mention, uh, there are lots of uh, support group uh, options in this in this country too. Um, AANA, Smart Recovery, uh, Life Ring. These are support groups for individuals who have um, alcohol use or uh, other substance use issues. Um, they're readily available in person in this country, but they're also available online. Uh, I don't know if they're, I think they are probably a, a, in other languages as well. Uh, I, I don't know that for sure, but I believe that probably is the case, especially with AA and NA. I don't know if, if Karen, if you want to add anything onto that, or that might be, might be it. I know that Smart Recovery um, has some um, European-based um, online groups. I'm not sure um, of all the languages that are offered. Um, they have a huge presence in the UK. And um, I think right now, actually, like, oh, like it's almost all of their services are available online. Smart Recovery um, is similar to um, AANA, which is 12-step you know, peer support, but they don't necessarily require a commitment for 100% absence from all substances. And so for some people who um, don't feel like AANA 12-step is a good fit for them, um, Smart Recovery is a really nice alternative. And 
they often aren't a good fit for teenagers who don't want to participate in a group that might feel really dogmatic. Um, and there's a reason why I think less than 5% of AA and NA is under the age of 21. It's just not really a youth driven um, a group, a support service, you can say, but I, I think that smart recovery life ring are ones that probably skew a little younger. And uh, I, at least I know I, I've had more success in getting uh, teenagers to uh, attend uh, smart recovery and life ring meetings. Yeah, I think that if um, if someone, especially with mild to moderate substance use, who's a youth, goes to AANA, um, unfortunately, sometimes if they're not mature enough and they don't really have someone to process, you know, like, like what they experience there, that sometimes they walk away with the idea of like, okay, wow, like the other people, those those older people in the group really have a problem with drug and alcohol use and maybe my drug and alcohol use is not so bad. And so I... I don't often recommend AANA um, unless like it's a you know older adolescent, it's really clear, you know, that they um, you know, uh, for example, like um people who tend to have like a little bit more of a stronger adherence to a religious practice sometimes feel like AA is a really good fit because there's um some religious components around like accepting a higher power that they really kind of um they speaks to them. But I do think for some, it just seems like that um, that whole idea we mentioned earlier around it when parents, you know, and support. From schools and other people provide this sort of protective layer that minimizes, you know, um, the uh, the uh, substance use symptoms and the functional deficit that might result from their use. That that you know gets reinforced sometimes in AA. And that's it for our slides. Uh, good evening and good morning, everybody. We are ready for our questions. I think we have like six questions. Do you want me to read it? How do you feel? Uh, sure. How can I help to my daughter, seven years old, who wants to play video games? She's bright, 2E, twice exceptional child with diagnosed HDHD and ODD. Her peers spent most of her time, uh, most of her time in rubber blocks. We're trying to model a healthy behavior, but both parents work from home, so we spend a lot of time on computers. Uh, I think Karen and I can both maybe uh, contribute some to that question. So, someone who's seven, um, I guess, thinking more from a, a medical perspective. Uh, I want to make sure that they've had, it sounds like they've had an evaluation and diagnosed with ADHD, uh, want to make sure that they're treated properly with medications. Again, I don't necessarily know what, what that option might be in the, in the Ukraine, but um, I imagine there are options to treat with medication, ADHD, um, stimulants, and I know there are non-stimulant options out there too. Uh, so I think that could potentially help. Um, so I think generally the advice I give is uh, just try and, uh, I know that parents are busy, especially if, if you have two working parents, but anything you can do to, to create structure and activities throughout the day, uh, your kid's just going to be better off and they're going to be less focused on their video games. Um, I, I guess I, I might have missed how, how many hours a day are they playing video games for, if, if that was even mentioned. This so, was not mentioned. Okay. No. Yeah, so again, we, we, we don't entirely know uh, what a specific time might be as far as how many hours of video gaming throughout a day is actually detrimental. I would say to a parent, though, if you feel like Again, I, I mentioned this in the in the lectures, in, in the slides. Um, if you feel like your kid is, if it's if they're not sleeping well, if they're not eating well, if it seems like maybe the the video games have affected their mood, or if because they're playing video games so much that um, you know they they don't seem to have interest in other activities, then that means some level of intervention is is probably necessary. 
And the first step I usually counsel parents is that I know that you're you're busy, <laughs> but you really need to think of of any way possible to increase uh, what we would call pro-social activities. And I know that that's that's hard with what everyone's going through in Ukraine. Uh, to the best of your ability, I think is what I would suggest. Thank you so I would much. add to that it's really it's okay for parents to acknowledge um, how much kids enjoy doing that, and I think that that's really important. We don't want to we don't want to minimize that part, or you know, if, and for some children, this is going to be the only opportunity, perhaps, to to play with certain friends or very special friends, um, or maybe perhaps any peers at all. And so I think that you know, for parents, like, where you don't have to con necessarily convince your child that gaming is not good for them, but instead something that they want to do in moderation, right? And that acknowledging, you know, I know you really like that game and I, I get, it's very fun. And I would even say, it, and you know, even if you like, okay, to like have the kid show you like, what game are, what game are you playing? And then trying to model back at the same time, what other like activity they might be able to do, um, whether that's just also like when, when you're not looking, like, you know, carving out like time to interact with your child um, yourself. And I also think uh, trying to create maybe some sort of a reward system. I think that it, it the same age, if a, if a kid is, uh, if you think your kid is, is playing video games too much in front of a screen too much, I think it's totally appropriate to think of a reward type system if they're willing to, uh, to do what, again, we would call maybe more pro-social activities, things that don't involve a screen. Uh, so I think that's healthy and, and appropriate. You know, if, if, if your kid is thinking of um, playing a sport, playing soccer in the neighborhood, whatever it might be, I think creating, uh, you know, it can be sort of like a nominal incentive, uh, but something just to get them motivated to actually go outside. I think that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking down. We have some questions uh, regarding it. Does frequent screen use necessarily lead to addiction? Now my son has all lessons online and communication with friends too. This is the only one constant that remain after forced relocation and that calms him down. There is no effect on behavior. Is it addiction? Uh, so Possibly <laughs> and, and possibly not. Uh, so again, I, I think we really look at the functional impairment. Uh, if if someone if someone's school is entirely online and that's how they're communicating with their friends, um, then I I think it, it probably is an addiction. Even if they're maybe you know using their their phone or their screen for seven eight hours in a day, um, you know if if they're not if they don't seem like they're getting depressed, if they're eating okay, if they're going to sleep on time, then, then they probably wouldn't meet criteria for uh, like a technology or screen use uh, disorder. Um, again, I, I think this is sort of an emerging research field as far as trying to figure out how much time might be correlated with, uh, with with increased rates of depression or anxiety disorders developing, potentially even ADHD developing. Uh, I have come across studies that suggested as little as six hours a day uh, using some form of, of screen could actually uh, lead to higher, potentially lead to higher rates of, of depression, uh, but it's something that we need to keep uh, keep our eye on, continue to study. Um, so I would say look out for the functional impairments, but also understand that there probably is a, a cutoff as far as time where it probably is healthy from the standpoint of your kid's going to be more likely to develop a problem if maybe they're in front of a screen for six or seven hours in a day. Thank you so much. Um, it's another following question. What is a healthy amount of time for four or five years old toddler 
with ASD to spend watching TV. He's addicted to cartoons. Thank you. I have a lot of questions today. Anonymous is like everybody asking. Yeah, you know, I almost want to pull up the uh, the AAP criteria for uh, under five year old uh, patients again. I usually um, <laughs> I usually focus so much on kids who are older than five because it's so interesting. Our the AAP is the American Academy of Pediatrics, and uh, their their guideline is if you're above the age of five, it's essentially up to the parents to decide how much screen time is healthy. And you can say they kind of punt on the issue and that's because we need more, more data, we need more research. Um, I don't wanna the misquote it. I don't know if we're able to, to kind of pull up the AAP uh, guidelines on, on screen use. I believe it's something like if you're four to five, it's not supposed to be for more than an hour a day, but I, I could be wrong on that. But if you if you want to know what what the the Academy, the American Academy of Pediatrics thinks uh, about that issue, uh, they have their guidelines and I believe they have specific um, time results if you're four to five. I don't know if, if, if Karen, you might you might know them offhand. I, I can't. I'd have to look. It's a uh, look. You know, the World Health Organization recommends no screen time for those under the age of two and for a max of one hour from two to five. Um, and I think the AAP, it's very similar. Um, it's one hour, I believe, for those that are aged um, 24 months to five. And they, um, and for the same reason that you mentioned that there seems to be some emerging evidence around the development of ADHD in conjunction with excessive screen time. Yeah, I, 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 okay, so I'm glad you, you were able to verify that. So yeah, my, my impression was I believed it was, it was in one hour or less. So it sounds mm -hmm. like that's, that's true. Yeah. Thank you so much. Second, next question, professional question. I deal with patients from Ukraine reporting an increased substance use among their partners who are staying in Ukraine. No more details. Uh, well, we didn't talk about Al-Anon. Um, Al-Anon is another group that's sort of based out of uh, the AA and A model, and it's specifically for uh, family members of individuals who are substance users so maybe they would uh be good candidates to find an an online um al-anon group and that's a l uh a n o n and karen i don't know if you if you had any other thoughts on that yeah um i think the um uh, i think that mostly just that um, when we're thinking about trying to support you know, um, an adult level in our life, that really trying to recognize that we don't have control of other people's use. And it's really natural to worry, of course, about someone we really care about if we seem to have excessive use. And then what often happens when we worry and um, we're out of control is that then we tend towards sort of like, you know, feelings of anger and frustration that come out often, right, in terms of like conflict, verbal aggression, right, arguments. And so, and the, um, there's a, a modality here in the United States called the CRAFT method. It's community reinforcement approach and family training. And their, their main suggestion is to really look at trying to move away from arguing with your loved one about their use and really instead trying to kind of highlight what are the things I, you know, like, you know, sort of doing with you or spending time with you when you're not using, um, and then uh, really trying to like avoid, um, avoid them if actually, if you can, like while they're under the influence. And at the same, and it's the same sort of principle you talked about before around like, you know, the conflict in interpersonal relationships doesn't usually help with reduction in use and, you know, um, and addiction. And so although it's really, it's really difficult and, you know, of course, like, okay, that we you know, care about our loved ones so much, but that you're trying your best, I actually think, to like, encourage them not to use, but to sort of also know that we can't control that and to try and take care of yourself as best you can um, and sort of in light of it. 
it's a little more challenging to find craft manuals. I, I have to do a lot of digging <laughs> uh, to find yeah. it. So that's, that's actually partly why I mentioned Al-Anon instead, but it is mm -hmm. important to, to note that uh, when craft is compared to Al-Anon, craft uh, almost always comes out ahead in, 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 in studies between the two uh, models in that, in this case. Yeah, and the, the primary goal actually of the craft method is really that um, you're you're going to instead try and improve your own quality of life instead of the quality of life you're addressing the addiction of the other person. Um, what, and in doing that, the um, essentially it's like it makes sobriety um, more appealing to the person who's using. Um, and I'm not sure that's a, I, I'm, I'm not certain like how many translations um, are available. Of, um, of the craft method. They do have a self-help book um, that's meant for, consu um, for consumers. It's called um, Get Your Loved Ones Sober. Um, and it's really looks, it's mostly like, you know, a way to think about like communicating differently, like moving away from arguing and threatening, you know, um, those types of communication into instead just trying to kind of clearly like communicate how you feel about it. Um, yeah, I'm not, yeah, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's translated. If it is, I, I think it, it is a great guidebook uh, for the kind of situation described. And again, I think it is important to note that in most studies, craft uh, is considered probably more effective than al -Nabi. but you can do both. I think there's a place for both. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I put in the chat some links uh, for every uh, program which you mentioned. So next question. In our practice, I put it in bracket former Soviet, psychologists try to dive deeper into trauma. They are waiting for catharsis. However, I think that creates a secondary trauma. How should I work with adolescents? I was translating these questions and I asked for details. I didn't get any more details. I'm sorry. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think that first, when we look at trauma treatment, that we really should be certain what, like, what does the patient want to talk about and work on, right? And so I think that if, um, like, if there's a lot of, like, reluctance, or if there's a lot of substance use that's happening, like, outside of session, then I think it's really sort of worth looking at, like, is this person, like, do they have enough, like, alternative coping skills right now to manage their trauma? Um, a very popular, um, past focused trauma model in the United States is called the trauma focused cognitive behavior therapy. And when we look at the, there's like a very clear chronological step of how you deliver that treatment. Um, and after report is essentially that you're going to, um, you're going to teach, you know, um, coping skills, and then you're going to bring in a parent or a support, you know, loved one. And, you know, your patient's going to teach that person coping skills. And so if you know, so they can be supported outside the session. So if you are, if your patient really isn't able, I think to um, to demonstrate their ability to you know their healthy coping skills outside the session, but that's where usually what I would recommend to start with. Um, and I do agree. I think that a lot of people would really benefit once they cease their substance use um, and they you know really worked on this sort of present focus like trauma model that they um, they would benefit quite a bit from doing like past past processing. And um, the book I mentioned earlier um, is Judith, Dr. Judith Herman, um, Trauma and Recovery, written in 1992. And I'm like, I know it has a lot of translations available. I'm not, not certain. I tried to look it up, I'm sorry, and I couldn't find um, a translation list for it, but that I think really does, like she really does a deep dive first into sort of the history of trauma treatment. Um, and at the same time, the way her book is written, I think it's really great for both, um, for both professionals and patients, but she actually, you know, she describes quite a bit, like sort of her model of looking at first present focus on trauma treatment and then going into what she calls records, um, like morning um, phase, which is phase two, past processing for, of trauma. Thank you so much. Okay, 
Can you share the link and resources regarding adolescent community or enforcement approach? Is it possible to use it after disaster and grief? Is any study regarding use of that program among autistic adolescents? That's a bit tricky question. <laughs> like four questions, three questions and one. Um, so yes, I'll I'll find I'll find a link and drop it. Um into the chat, the um, the um, community reinforcement approach and family training. I, I'm not aware of any studies that it's been used um, with autistic patients, but I, I did hear that they are actually currently trialing it, um, I believe at Yale with um, young adults who have psychosis. And I think one of the, um, one of the things that's very really beneficial about like thinking about how we like might sort of coach families and loved ones on how to respond differently um, and acknowledging that, you know, if we, if we respond in a way that just creates, you know, arguments and conflict, that often that becomes the focus of like what, whatever we're, you know, worried about that in that moment. And so, although I, I, I don't, I can't point to the study that I'm aware of in terms of using it with, you know, with those with autism, um, I can say that I have, and I've, and I think that there's still like a lot of like, you know, potential benefit, especially if we're looking at, you know, um, patients with more like mild um, ASD diagnosis that really trying to, um, you know, to speak for parents to speak from, like from their own perspective without threatening and nagging um, really does like um, tend to work more so, right. Than you know, um, like being very directive, um, and I'm not sure if I answered, like there was four, I'm not sure if I hit all four questions with that. Uh, actually, so it, just to share something about ACRA too, um, the, uh, the modules are, they're all available online. And, um, you know, it, it, if I, I, ideally you would have a trained practitioner who's gone through training, uh, there might be some certifications, Karen would know about that for ACRA. I think there, there are. Uh, but you know, if, if you're in Ukraine and you want to use this, um, I don't know if there's translations for it, but, um, you can, you can kind of read through the modules and, and get a sense of, of how it works. And I think you can honestly apply those principles as a parent or a clinician without really being trained in it, um, and, and get some use out of it. I, I am. Yep. That's um, that's ACRA. Um, I'm they don't crazy. have it. They don't have information in Russian and Ukrainian, English, Dutch. And I guess, you know, and I'll add that um, I think for, for the professionals that um, in large part craft is really based on, you know, operant conditioning. And so, right, thinking about like, how can we, how can we help families think about how to provide like rewards um, versus like punishment and what's the difference in, in the outcome? Um, I think it's very important to acknowledge the family members that it's normal to be frustrated, right? And that it's normal for our frustration to translate into like, you know, um, changes the way we communicate with people. But does it work, right? If I yell at my kid because they're drinking or I'm yelling at my spouse because of their substance use, is that resulting in the outcome that I'm wanting to see, which ultimately is there for them to reduce their use? Uh, and if, if not, I think that, you know, it's, although it can be really challenging, but changing, um, changing our like sort of communication strategy can be really effective. Thank you so much. Next questions. Adult autistic person in Ukraine now have a problem with the alcohol. He has a big trauma because he works with army and every week some of his friends or families, familiars die. He is alone. And alcohol is one way to deal with all of this. How to help?
So I think if we're looking at like for those that are we are really isolated from other people, that if we are going to suggest that people stop using alcohol, we definitely have to help them process and figure out how will life be rewarding without it. Um, after you know, they're during like sort of withdrawal and like initial kind of you know um, early recovery phase, that really trying to help people sort of build like you know where else can they connect with community. That's um, in the United States, one of the benefits of attending Alcoholics Anonymous and 12-step groups is that um, not just that the group itself is beneficial, but that for people who've been, sometimes you might go to a meeting and find someone who's been attending 30, 40 years. And the reason they do that is because they often have um, some type of social aspect also, you know, or fellowship, they sometimes call it, aspect of different meetings where they might do things like, you know, have, um, like engage in pro-social activity together, so hiking groups, AA dances is a really common thing in the United States. Um, AA bowling leagues, right? So, if we're um, if someone's going to stop you, I think really helping them figure out what would they do instead, right? And especially if they're drinking daily or almost daily, and we think about you know that if your use is taking up a lot of your time, if you stop using and you're bored, um, boredom, right? Loneliness are some of the biggest relapse triggers to deal with. So, it's not enough for them to necessarily just stop and get through their withdrawal period, but to think about What's my life? What's my time going to look like after that? And I would hope that that person has access to a medical doctor, perhaps a psychiatrist. Um, he is a, a, there are pharmacotherapy, there are medication options that I think could potentially help someone uh, who's just described. Yeah, and I think, right, and I think. Dr. Zingerman, that often, you know, when we, like, a lot of people don't feel great when they initially stop using, right? And it's um, it's definitely something you have to address. And during the initial withdrawal period, you might notice like some mood changes. But I think that you know, if we look at someone who is really, you know, in sustained recovery and they're perhaps, you know, having difficulty sleeping or, you know, significant, you know, sort of like mood issues, um, I guess, you know, having support from a psychiatrist would be really essential in addressing, like, is there perhaps like a co-occurring um, diagnosis going on, such as like maybe depression or anxiety? And I mentioned naltrexone uh, before, and that's a medication that can, um, that, that can help reduce someone's urges to use. They don't just have to be abstinent to, to take it. This can be someone who Maybe maybe someone's having eight drinks uh, a day, but they have some desire to maybe reduce, but they're still maybe ambivalent about uh, about absence. Maybe they start naltrexone then, and then um, I can type the name, and then uh, they go from maybe eight drinks a day to four drinks a day. That's a pretty substantial reduction. And then if that person then is on is, is drinking four drinks a day then ultimately, if they decide to quit, they're going to experience much less potential withdrawal from the alcohol. And again, so it's called naltrexone, and I would say this is the gold standard medication we use with uh, alcohol use cravings and to sustain abstinence in the United States. Thank you so much. Okay, we have two more questions. Can you describe about 12 step programs international translation? Do you know any of the program available for Ukrainian refugee adults and teenagers? Can you repeat that question again? Can you describe about 12-step program, international translations? Do you know any other program available for Ukrainian refugees, adult and teenagers? Like, open think, questions. We mentioned the main ones. So there's AA, NA, Smart Recovery, Life Ring is another one. I, I'm not sure which, which of those might have translations. There are specific women's recovery groups. Uh, there's something called um, Dharma recovery, uh, which is like a, a Buddhist model of, of recovery. Um, uh, 
there's quite a few options out there that you can find online. I, I'm not entirely sure which of those might have um, Ukrainian translations or options. Thank you so much. Okay, last question. I'm working with a young man who is neurodiverse, dealing with depression and struggling with alcohol addiction. He's overseas without proper support group. No more details. Why well, I think the, the idea of it's, the last part of that statement was no support group. Uh, so hopefully through this, uh, this, this webinar, this presentation, uh, we've increased knowledge about what's out there. Um, these are programs that have, uh, that, that are better at, that have global reach at this point, especially something like AA and NA. Thank you so much. We don't have any more questions. So if you have any last comments or anything else, like, thank you so much for answering all questions. And I know some of the question was very tricky. I was just looking myself and like, oops. Yeah, this is a very challenging, uh, it's challenging topic. The, these are challenging patients to treat. Um, I, I want to point out that uh, we, we don't, we certainly don't have everything figured out in the United States. Uh, the idea of a dual diagnosis patient or, or teenager, someone who has uh, both a mental health disorder like depression, anxiety, and also a substance use disorder, uh, data indicates that in this country, only around 5% of teenagers that, that meet those criteria actually have treatment for both. So uh, we, we're, we lag, <laughs> we're lagging behind, I think, the absolutely the, the treatment needs of the population here. So I imagine there's much need for this in, in Ukraine and hopefully um, learning more about the different resources that are out there online can help. Um, and like I mentioned, something like ACRA, I don't know if anyone in, in Ukraine has, has been certified as an ACRA instructor, but I think it, at the very minimum, someone can, can go online, look at that, look at the, the modules and, 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 and take some, some valuable information away. And I think we will try to save all chat and all links. So it's going to be available after this presentation. And I'd just like to say uh, thank you, everyone who was presenting, Dr. Zickerman. Aaron, um, it's thanks a lot. It's just like, I know it's a difficult topic. It's just, I'm just still curious that all question was like, uh, how they was presented today anonymously. So we kind of understand it's not an easy topic for folks to speak. And thank you everybody who asks the questions because that's mean a lot for us. And thanks to everyone. And especially a big thank you to all Stanford team for helping and providing support. Because I mean, I can't say from my side, but I mean, I try to voice all Ukrainians, friends, colleagues, and maybe it's really important for us. And big, big thank you for Crystal and our interpreters and everybody who's recording these webinars and recording their voices. Do not forget to send me all files later. Sorry, I will use this opportunity to remind everybody. 
and we have in the chat a uh, form will be nice if you can answer this form and we'll have some suggestion and idea about future topic. Thanks everybody. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you everyone.